Well, good morning. First of all, let me thank the organizers for having me here uh, in this wonderful country and um, probably the most advanced country on, the, on this globe, in particular when it comes to um, well, a bit of digital skepticism that um, has spread over, over here, as I discovered, uh, probably a bit more among normal people than in many other countries. For, let, let me start out saying that I'm a scientist and a medical doctor. And uh, science and medicine is, is, is for decades no longer possible without digital information technology. So I'm not against uh, progress or against use, the use of digital information technology. Hey, I've got my, I brought my own Macintosh. I have a uh, I, have, oh, I have a smartphone, a br brilliant tool for communication and other things. I even have an Apple Watch. It doesn't work so well, but I still have it. And um, so, so I am. And, and I was an early adopter with computers. I had, I bought my own first computer in 1984, and it cost like as much as a little car. And the, and the printer cost another car. And, and I still did it because it was very important to, to as, a, as a young researcher to do the number crunching and the writing, etc., with the aid of this wonderful technology. But then I got into learning that the reason for this was I have five kids. Well, by now I have six kids, but in any event, I have a smaller one also. So, um, and ha having my kids coming home from school telling me strange stories, I got really into learning and even into learning in schools, founded a little institution about neuroscience and learning, and, um, and along the way talked to a lot of politicians, etc., etc. So I'm kind of interested in, in what's going on in the educational system as well, and I've been so for 15 years. And I wrote my first popular book on neural networks. That is, the business model of the world's richest companies by now. That is, how to implement what we know about the brain in machines that then can learn by themselves. And as you know, that was brain theory 30 years ago. Now it's the business model of Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook. And they make, these are the richest companies on earth, and they make their money by implementing brains in computers, and they work like brains, and they, we call this machine learning or artificial intelligence, but it's not programming. They, these machines learn by themselves because they are set up to work like brains. Who teaches these, these machines? Well, the population of this globe, because we use the services of these companies. Uh, you have heard about them, just Facebook, Amazon, and, and the more we spend time, our time with them, the more we educate their computers to predict what we are going to buy and do next. And, um, and, and this is, again, uh, has led to very rich companies. And um, whatever has effects, and digital media have large effects, okay, comes with risks and side effects. This is a medical truism. By the way, if your doctor tells you, you can, you can take this pill, it has absolutely no side effects. You can just as well not take this pill because it will have no effect. Um, <laughs> everything that has effects has risks and side effects. And nobody talks about the risks and side effects of digital information technology. The media are full of how great everything is and it's this progress and we are going to be a ha lead a happy life and we'll be brighter and more educated and everything will be better using social media. Well, I'll, I will run you through risks and side effects in health. After all, I'm a medical doctor in the first place. In education and in society. Part of health is mental health, and this is my specialty, which is why I have special data on this too. But uh, I'm talking about health, education, and society. And once I'm through this, you, you can make up your own mind uh, about the, the weighing of the pros and the cons of giving out, well, smartphones to babies, for example. I promise you there are more cons to do that than pros. Um, and uh, with, uh, with regard to older children or adolescents, there are also quite a few cons, not, even, not only pros, okay? So this just for the start. And one more thing, you need not trust me in anything. You can just Google everything yourself. You'll, <laughs> you'll find it. So I'm talking about science and medical literature. I'm not talking about my gut responses to having seen children doing this and this, okay? That's important. And it's not me saying what I will say today, it's the scientific literature saying this today. And uh, I'm also not cherry picking, finding my studies, no. If you Google things, you will find the so-called opposition. Studies that show that computers make kids brighter don't exist. If you find a single one, tell me. 
I have written four books on the subject and I oversee about 2,500 uh, scientific papers on the subject. And I'm not giving you my biased view. I'm giving you the view from these 2,500 papers. Okay? And again, the opposite side hardly exists or just does not exist. Well, this is an overview on the risks and side effects, uh, uh, physical risks and side effects. Uh, you would believe me, bad body posture. You know, that that's, has been mentioned for years. Overweight. No doubt if you sit around and play with screens, uh, you are going to be overweight in the long run. And that's been shown, of course. Diabetes. You may know, what, what, what does digital, digital media have to do with diabetes? Well, if you have sleep disorders, that increases your risk of getting diabetes. Um, by quite an extent, and that has been shown in the last 10 years, roughly in the last 10 years. So, and diabetes, just like hyper, uh, hypertension, gives you stroke and heart attacks, which are the number one causes of death in our societies. We have data showing that um, high internet use kind of doubles uh, the likelihood of having high blood pressure in 14 to 17 year olds. So doubling the blood pressure is a real problem because this is cause of death number one. And if we double this cause, I mean, you have twice as many as we have now, and this is the leading cause of death, okay? And if you add up uh, diabetes as well, you get the two most prominent risk factors increased by digital media use. This is probably the worst aspect of digital media that, has not looked, uh, that hasn't been discussed at all. Uh, in, in, in much of the literature. But again, we have experimental evidence, we have sleep lab evidence, we have physiological evidence on high blood pressure. So the evidence is out there, it's just not discussed. Um, high risk behavior, just one notion. Did you know that the smartphone has surpassed alcohol as the number one cause of traffic accidents in younger folks? So this is another thing where you have a big impact but it's just not discussed. On German autobahns, you see smartphones and you see tip, tip, dead. So we have, we have a, 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 a big uh, promotion not to use your smartphone when you drive, particularly not on the autobahn. Okay. And this is because there, there is this big problem with smartphone-caused traffic accidents. And it's not just high risk in traffic, it's also high risk in sexual behavior. For years now, we have an increase in sexually transmitted diseases, and there are studies showing that this goes along with the use of Tinder and Grindr, the so-called geosocial dating apps. Uh, Tinder alone causes 15 million casual sex encounters a day, and that changes the world incidence and prevalence of sexually transmitted disorders, to no doubt. Okay. So these are just tiny little things that are down here. And um, I want to give you an example that you probably have, haven't heard about also. This is short-sightedness or the medical term myopia. It has been found out, well, you know, this is a familiar sight, and um, that looking at close range, uh, well, notice these, they both have glasses, okay? Looking at close range change the way the eye grows. Because we, we used to think, well, the eye just grows. Children have small eyes and then they get bigger and somehow they stop growing, that's that. No, what we do know by now is this. The eye grows until it's in focus and then it stops growing, which is a wonderful mechanism. It's actually implemented in the retina that the eye stops growing when the, when the average image that's on the retina is sharp, is in focus. Okay. The problem is, if you... Well, this is an elongated eye, which is why the rays, they, they meet before the retina, which is why this eye is, in, is out of focus. It's actually a myopic eye, which is why you have to have a lens to correct this so that yeah, they meet back here. So this is a small eye of a kid. Now it grows, okay, and this is the normal growth. But if you look at short range, the, the rays meet way, way back, so the eye will automatically b become elongated. So if you have a lot of near-range looking, like, for example, 100 years ago, if you read books for 10 hours a day, you would need glasses eventually because your eye is just too long and if you then look at a far distance, you won't see properly. Okay? The book reading is no longer a problem. In Germany, young folks read for 15 minutes a day books. Okay? But, 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 but notice this. 
is the most used digital device on the globe with more than 5 billion users. It's also the smallest. So we look at this thing at the closest range of any digital devices. Rather close. Okay. In South Korea, for example, the average young person looks at this 5.4 hours a day, on average. And you add to this tablets, playstations, or game consoles, you add the computer and you add a TV, that's probably also not that far, but it's, it's the furthest of all screen devices. Okay. So what happens? Well, uh, you get this and then you need glasses. Well, this is a study, 2015, from a lot of European authors, that basically ophthalmology professors who threw their data in one pot and tried to figure out what's the prevalence of short-sightedness in Europe. And it turns out it's about 30% among young people, it's 50%. The usual prevalence in retired people in Europe, for example, is 1 to 5%. So we have an increase from 1 to 5 to 50% in Europe. The data from China are worse, 80%. South Korea, the number, the, the, the number one maker of smartphones, think Samsung, they don't earn as much. Apple is the biggest earner, but Samsung pr produces the most smartphones. So in South Korea, you have over 95% of short-sighted people in the under 20-year-olds. That's an entire epidemic of short-sightedness, of, uh, uh, of basically a, a disability, a seeing disability that has developed because they look at close range. Okay. And they actually they start taking action. Did you know that in, in South Korea they not only had 95% of short-sightedness, a couple of years ago they had 30% of smartphone addiction. 30. In Germany we have between 2 and 8, depending on the study. 2 and 8% smartphone addiction. By the way, smartphone addiction now is a, a, an acknowledged um, disease by the WHO, by the World Health, Health Organization, that was acknowledged as a, as a disease, uh, internet and computer uh, addiction uh, in uh, July 2018. Okay, so we know that we are not, I'm not talking about possibilities. This is a reality and it's really bad. Okay, South Korea, 85% uh, um, short sightedness. So the South Korean government. Too bad the government representative went away. The South Korean government made legislation to prevent the worst um, risks and side effects to young people in South Korea. So by law, if you buy a smartphone and you are under 19, the age when you get an adult in South Korea, software has to be installed by law that prevents you from accessing, well, pornography and violence that measures the time you, you, you spend with this, and if it's over a certain predetermined threshold, your parents automatically get a notification, take, please take more care of your kid, it spends too much time on the smartphone. And thirdly, um, the, the access to games is cut off at midnight, so you can't play all night. So this is at least an attempt by the state that produces the most smartphones on the globe to shield their young generation from the worst side effects of this. Okay? So, again, they are making these, okay? But they realize this is not good for our next generation. And we will be hurt a lot by this, so let's do something. The Chinese, a couple of weeks ago, have forbidden this at all schools. And the reasoning, it was published um, uh, by the Chinese government, the reasoning is this, we have 1.3 billion Chinese. If 80% are going to be short-sighted, that's about a billion people. Short-sightedness has risks on its own in long, in, in, for the elderly, just like blood pressure and diabetes have risks of stroke and heart attacks. Short-sightedness have risks of increasing um, glaucoma, cataract, um, uh, macular degeneration and retina ablation, these are causes of blindness. And the rough estimate is that about 10% of myopic people will become blind at old age. And uh, President Xi has figured, well, 10% of a billion, that's 100 million blind people. We can't cope with that. So let's get rid of this in schools. Because in school you look at close range and then you go to recess and during recess, if you allow smartphones, they will all take out their smartphones in a time, 20 minutes or so, when they should look at wide range 
outside to prevent short-sightedness because we know if you look at wide range outside with bright light that can prevent the development of short-sightedness. But if you allow this in the recess they will continue doing this and this will get, make them short-sighted in the long run. So again the Chinese have come up with legislation to protect at least one, one problem to protect their, their young from at least one problem that comes with this and there are more um, for sure. Well, what to do about this problem? Well, I just said it. it. It's caused by interfering with normal development. So this interferes with brain, actually brain development because the eyes are part of the brain anatomically. And there's no right way of looking at this. Okay? As people often say, well, we have to learn to how to look at this. Well, there's no right way. Um, as long as your eyes still grow. Once you have developed eyes, that is by 25 to 30, you can, look as, you can look at your smartphone as long as you like. You won't get short-sighted because your eyes are done eventually by about 25. Okay? They no longer grow. And then looking at this is not a problem. So it's a problem in particular during the time of development. The dosage makes the poison. Just looking for five minutes at it doesn't make a difference. But it's the dosage and we way overdose this thing in our next generation. That's beyond the question. Um, we have, therefore, as I just said, we have to protect our children and adolescents and Korea does it. The Chinese do it already. Adults, no action needed. Next problem, sleep disorder. Why is this a problem? Because it's highly prevalent. Well, I'm talking about this. This is a Norwegian study who clarified how prevalent this is. They looked at 9,846 boys and girls and this is their electronic device use during the last hour before bedtime, before going to sleep. Okay? So it's about 90%, 90, 90 somewhat in girls and uh, well, 80 in boys. This is a typical Scandinavian, very politically correct slide. The girls are blue and the boys are green. <laughs> As a German, you have to get used to this. So I, I keep going, uh, this is the boys. No, this is the girls. So. But you can see this is the boys because the console is used more by the boys. And every study that comes out shows that the girls are doing chatting and Facebook and the boys are doing gaming, okay, and shooting enemies. But you see, the prevalence of, of use of these is quite high. It's not just a few kids, it's 90% of the kids using electronic media. So what comes with this? Well, electronic media emit a lot of blue light. This is the spectrum of electronic uh, of, of a screen. This is the spectrum of daylight, this is the spectrum of uh, well, candlelight or the light, incandescent light, uh, light old-fashioned light bulbs. Okay? So because human beings have sitting at, at fireplaces for two million years by now, uh, we have adopted to, and, and developed uh, receptors for blue light in our eyes that, that we don't use for seeing, but the output of these receptors goes straight to the uh, internal clock and resets the clock. So when you look at blue light at 11 or 11.30 at night, you tell your clock it's still day, which is why at 7 in the morning it knows it must be still night. So you're more sleepy. Okay. Secondly, when blue light hits the circadian clock that sits above the hypothalamus that gives you the hormones and you normally, when it's getting dark, the hypothalamus starts to secrete melatonin which we also call the sleep hormone. But when you look at blue light, later on, sleep hormone secretion is blocked because hey, it's still day, you must not sleep during the day. Okay. Which is why your sleep gets in a, sort of, in a way a double whammy. You, you, and, and next morning alertness gets cer certainly a double whammy because in the morning you have slept less and you have a reset internal clock. So for two reasons you are tired. These are the kind of studies that uh, come with this. So here we have evidence of light emitting e-readers negatively, that's basically iPads, negatively affect sleep, circadian timing and next morning alertness. PNAS 2004, well, 2015. Okay, these are the data. The more you use screens, the less you sleep, up to two hours less. That's not not something to to, uh, to overlook. It's a big effect. Okay, and um, so what to do? Well, this happens at any age. This happens to you as well. Okay, uh, looking the right way, no way. Okay, as you look at it, you 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 block your melatonin secretion if you do this at night in the dark. Okay. The timing is the poison. No color screens after dinner. 
There is a technological fix. iOS 9.3 and beyond and it's also available for Android. There's Night Shift and if you activate this app it will block the blue light coming from this. The technical fix has a problem. It doesn't, it, it, it's not taking care of everything that comes with your smartphone. If you, if you, it's, if, if before you go to sleep, you, you go into Facebook and you find your, your relationship status has changed, you'll sleep not so well uh, for, for other reasons. And there's no technical fix for that. So, yes, there is some technical fix, but not an entire technical fix. And in children and adolescents, this is really important, just a second, um, because they go to school in the morning. And teachers tell me that in the last couple of years, children become ever more tired in the first couple of hours in school. And this is, again is a double whammy for learning because you learn less if you are tired. And if you sleep less next night, you, we, we talk about consolidation and reconsolidation of memory. So you basically fixate what you've learned the day, over the day in the night thereafter. And if you sleep less, you do less of fixation. So you learn less and of this little that you learned, you do less of fixation. This is really, really bad for your educational career. Yes? There are no color screens after dinner. Does this apply for television as well? Yes. Basically, yes. Uh, you can argue that television is further away. And that makes a big difference because light, the, the energy of light, dissip um, uh, decreases with the, uh, the square of the... Um, of the distance. So um, twice as wide is four times less light energy on your retina, which is why this is, even though it's small, it's so dangerous because it's so close, okay? Compared to a TV that's 10 times as close. So it can be a hundred times dimmer and it's still as, as, as bright as TV, okay? So TV is probably not as big as a problem as this. So a, a tablet that's almost as big as a small TV, right here, that's the biggest, that's the biggest challenge to, for your sleep. Just as, the, as, as on my slide, the, 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 he had a, a tablet even, okay. So because children's brains develop under our supervision in our educational settings, uh, this problem uh, impairs brain development. And um, I, I will show you data that clearly shows this. Um, uh, so again, this is just a reminder of the, uh, and there's increased stress, uh, young children and adolescents, they, they, they say we have increased stress. Stress uh, dampens down your immune system, gives you more infectious diseases and also more cancer. We know this, okay. So here you have the, the, the most likely causes of, uh, of mortality and on top of this accidents and uh, so, so we are not talking about, you know, small effects. We are talking of a big health risk. And now add to this my specialty. Addiction, aggression, anxiety, depression, decreased empathy, decreased life satisfaction. These are well-known and well-researched side effects in psychiatry or on mental health of smartphones. Let me just run, run you through a bit of it. Anxiety, depression. This is a study of how Facebook predicts declines of subjective well-being in young adults. So the results, this is taken right off the journal, the more you are in Facebook, the, the lower your affect is. And because they did a longitudinal study, it's not that the depressed go to Facebook. No, it's going first to Facebook and then being depressed. And if you do this for quite a while, your life satisfaction goes down. It's not like Zuckerberg tells us that people are happy using Facebook. The more you use Facebook, the less happy you are, okay? And there are more studies on this. There's a big UK study and more than 1,000 girls showing that girls who spend more than three hours in Facebook when they are 13 have twice the chance of being depressed when they are 18. Okay, that came out by a large survey of uh, the British Health Service. So you double your risk of being depressed. Depression is one of the most prevalent diseases in young girls and adolescent girls and young women. It's not a tiny fraction. It's the most, one of the most common diseases they have. Okay? And we had doubled this by three hours of Facebook, which is not uncommon in girls to use three hours of Facebook. And if these days it's no longer Facebook, it can be Instagram or WhatsApp or Snapchat, which belongs to Facebook too and is linked to Facebook, so you can kind of escape Facebook 
five and a half billion users use any one of these, Facebook is used by two billion. Well, there's even a very larger scale US study on the same thing, and this is really serious. It came out in November 2017. Gene Twenge has looked at suicide rates in the US for the last more than a decade, and she found that in girls and young adult women, suicide rates in the US have doubled over the last seven years. Twice as many suicides, period. So that was the one finding, and she got this into a good journal. And then she also looked at, are there correlates of this? And she found, uh, in looking at half a million people b between 13 and 18, U.S. adolescents, okay? And, um, and she looked at suicidal ideation or suicidality. You know, a psychiatrist can ask about, well, did you think about it? Did you plan it? What kind of plan did you have? And how often do you think about it? So you can basically evaluate your risk of committing suicide. And we call this suicidal behavior and suicidal ideation. So they tried to figure out suicidal behavior and ideation in people. And they found that the more they use electronic devices, the more suicidal uh, um, risk factors they have. Okay. So adding one and one, adding we have a doubling of uh, suicides in the US, in girls. Girls use more Facebook and social media than boys. And social media make you depressed. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at the big picture, okay, then you see even this correlation. I know correlation is not causation. And I'm a scientist, I really do know the difference of those two phenomena. But if you have correlations, you have causal data in experiments when they looked at things. And if you have even more correlation and more causal data, then you end up with, well, this all fits into one big picture. Facebook's not good for people, particularly for women. Um, deep, um, decreased empathy. That's something that really scares me. Um, well, first of all, empathy, think about it. It's not something you are born with. It's something you learn, like talking and walking and many other things. How do you learn empathy? Well, we would constantly deal with other people, and by dealing with other people, we learn that their facial expressions, their locomotion, their melody of speaking changes whatever they say to us. So if they say, us, uh, say sad things, they will have a different melody and a different facial expression and a different body posture when, uh, compared to when they say nice things. And uh, eventually, after thousands and thousands of encounters with uh, a child does with other people, the child will have learned to figure out the, the mental state of another person just by looking at the person, okay? So you, you need not be told, I am not so well, you, you see it. That's a capability we develop over time by having these encounters. And you have to have real encounters. A screen with some words or even pictures or even movies doesn't do the trick. You need feedback and you need interaction in order to learn this, okay? Which is why this is the largest scale study on the globe we have on the development of empathy and the screen media influence on that. They looked at two large-scale longitudinal studies, one from Great Britain and one from New Zealand, threw the data together and found that the more screen time in hours per day adolescents have, the, less their the smaller their empathy for their parents and peers. So this is a fact that came out of the biggest studies on empathy that we have on the globe. Okay? So the more you use screens, the less emphatic you are. This is another study showing that uh, it's a meta-analysis of data from 1979 to 2009 with a total of 13,000 people. And, what, uh, and, and they talk about uh, empathy. And in fact, they talk about two things. Empathy, the, the one th the, it has an emotional aspect. The emotional aspect is, I, I know your feelings. I know how, how this feels. And then there is a cognitive aspect. If I know how you feel, I can put myself in your shoes or can see the, your world with your eyes so I can, I can take your perspective. So empathy has two components. It's the, the capability of feeling the feelings another person have and it's the, the, the cognitive side. You can think like the other person thinks from his perspective. 
So now what they did, they added these two variables, the cognitive and the, and the emotional aspect of empathy, and just looked at how this changed over time. And it was measured 40 years with the same measure over and over in young students. And this is empathy and perspective taking, taken together and the development over time. You see it decreased and it decreased ever larger and the largest decrease was lately. Is that purely academic? No. Let me give you just two examples from the German tabloid, you may have heard Bild Zeitung, it's the biggest German newspaper, it comes out every day with millions of circulation. So this was a story in Germany about a year ago, a retired man was laying in front of a cash machine and the first four people who withdrew cash just walked over the person, withdrew cash, stepped over the person again and went out. The fifth person started helping. And the man died a day later because help was too late. Okay. So you can't do any, you can't hardly do any version on empathy than the four, first four people. You're just walk, stepping over a person who obviously is in need of help. Okay. But there are th worse things. This is again from a German tablet. So there was a motorbike accident and the biker was dying. And the passerby didn't, didn't help the guy. No, he took out his smartphone and filmed the guy and put the film online. The German government has discussed a legislation. We'll get a new legislation. I'm not kidding. It was discussed, it was in the news. We'll get a new legislation and the, the, the content of the new uh, uh, law is you must not film dying people. I mean, how morally decayed do, is a society if you have to have such a law? We, have, we, have, we, we can film for 100 years now, and we didn't need such a law. Of course, now everyone has a, a camera, a film camera, with him or herself, yes. But even though it used to be common sense that you don't film a dying person, you are with the person, you help, and you are in the last hour, you, you, you be present, okay? No, it's no longer so. We need a law for this. This is really telling me, at least, that we have a problem. And police reports are full of, well, there were people on the street, injured people, people stopped, took a picture and, and moved on, and not helping. At least, I know in Scandinavia things are better, but in Germany, <laughs> it's, I've been in Italy lately, and, they, and I, talk, I told them this, and they said, oh, we have the same stories in our newspapers. So it's not a German, I can say it's not a German phenomenon, I can say it's a, at least a German-Italian phenomenon, um, not the Danish, I believe so. Okay, so addiction, just briefly. This is the first chart of, a, of an addictive brain that came out in the medical literature or in the brain research literature. That was 1997. They put cocaine addicts in the scanner, gave them cocaine or saline as a control, and then looked at the brain, uh, how it looks on cocaine versus saline. And here you have it, okay? And this is dynamic mapping of circuits activated by cocaine in the human brain, and here it is. It's called the nucleus accumbens or the ventral striatum. But just to make a long story short, who of you is a cocaine addict? Hands up. Well, see, that was the problem for science back in 1997 because we all have this brain part. And we, of course, we don't use it for cocaine addiction. The problem then was, well, what is it for? I mean, the, in the real world, it can't be our cocaine addiction center. That doesn't make sense, okay? And it, 20 years of research has found out that this is actually our learning turbocharge device. So whenever this lights up, we learn real fast. And this is its function. Okay. So it, it, if, if, you, if you fire it up with, a, with anything, it makes you addictive. So substances that fire this thing up lead to you want that substance because it's such a great feeling when you, when you get the substance. And the increase is much higher than just finding out something interesting when it lights up as well. We, we and other people, I mean, we have been part of the research on this thing to quite an extent. So we know quite a few data showing that this lights up when I give you an interesting information. Oh, ah, interesting, then it lights up, okay? Or if I ask you, are you, if you ask you a question and then I ask you, do you want to know? And those who say, oh yes, theirs is already up. 
So if you are motivated and curious, you fire basically your, your fast learning turbocharger before you even learn something, and that's very useful because it's, it's already on, and then you will learn really quickly and retain what you've learned. So this is turbocharged learning, but also addiction. Okay. Now let me show you a study that came out in 2014. They just showed people the F from Facebook. You know, the white F in the bluish background. And they used people with various degrees of Facebook addiction. There is Facebook addiction. You can measure it with the Facebook addiction scale. They did that. And this is an addiction score on the Facebook addiction scale. And this is signal change in this area. So you see the more Facebook addiction, the more signal change. That's a nice correlation here. And to, 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 to make the... But this, is, this is cocaine. This is Facebook. So much for people who, and I, in talk shows and uh, you know, I mean, in many discussions, ah, uh, well, you know, uh, non-substance um, uh, addiction forms are not really addictions. They are some misbehavior, and people try to talk very cloudy to, to, cloud, to cover this up. But here you have it. I mean, it really looks exact the same, okay? And in the brain, it is the same. And f for treatment, it's the same. We treat um, the uh, slot machine addiction just as we treat alcohol or cocaine addiction with the same drugs, with the same regimens, with the same therapeutic interventions. Okay, so it's to know. And as I said, the World Health Organization now says yes, there is computer and internet addiction, and this is a, the computer you have always with you, and is also an internet access device. So if there is computer and internet addiction, there certainly is smartphone addiction. In fact, this is the incarnation of computer and internet and net addiction because you carry it with you. So you have it always with you. Okay. Well, education. You see, I'm, well, I have the first 30 minutes. I'm on time. Um, so what do we have? Well, decreased attention. This is a study in 7,102 Chinese adolescents. It turns out the more they game on their smartphone, and people do a lot of gaming on this. This is, this is the replacement of game console for many young people. Okay? The more you game on this, the more likely you have ADHD, attention deficit disorder. So this is a large-scale study from China. Um, the myths of the digital native and the multitasker well, people say sometimes, this came out in 2017, people sometimes say, well, the digital natives, they can do all kinds of things at the same time. And the, and the proper answer is, no, they can't. In fact, for 20 years by now, we know from psycho psychology, nobody can multitask, not even women. <laughs> um, and and uh, in order to understand this, you have to know what multitasking is and what it is not. Multitasking is not, let me do this, okay? I wave, I hop, and I talk. And I could talk for half an hour like this without any problem, but why? This is not multitasking. Because hopping is completely automatic. Waving also is completely automatic. And I can do one thing, that is, think about what I talk. But media multitasking involves following semantic streams of information, two stories at the same time, two conversations at the same time. And nobody can do this. We can't. I mean, think about it. Nobody reads two books to be faster. <laughs> and you, I mean, you get it. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. And if you do, you, your performance will suffer. You will be slower and you will learn less from the two books. And to give you another example, there's a good reason why over there, there is not an other talk going on right now. I mean, it doesn't make sense, okay? And just because we have two or three screens in front of us, or a very big one, with the email, a paper, and uh, other things on it, we cannot do two things or three things at a time. We can do one thing at a time, and the best way of getting your work done is do one thing at a time, and then do the next thing at a time. And people who say, and a lot of people who say, well, multitasking is something we have to do, and it comes with the, the new age and with the new media, and so we just have to learn it, wrong. If you try to learn it, there are studies on this too, you train yourself to become, uh, to, 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 to become uh, inattentive. So if you try to multitask, you train yourself to have an attention deficit disorder. That has been shown. 
And in fact, people who do a lot of multitasking, they actually do worse in multitasking than non-multitaskers because they have an attention deficit and they train them to have an attention deficit. I'm, I'm very strict because I have seen pedagogic people saying we have to have multitasking as a new school subject. It's impossible on several counts. You cannot learn it. No way. And if you learn it, your performance gets down, not up. Okay. So we must not have a new school subject and we must not encourage multitasking. I have seen job advertisements. The candidate should know English, office applications and be able to multitask. Well, this is asking, please be inattentive. So, I mean, employers should know that please don't multitask and they should not ask their clients to multitask. It's, a, it's, it's complete nonsense. Um, well, this is an old study t from 2010. They had the smartphone sitting here and they had five minutes doing a task and during the five minutes at minute three the thing rang. Okay, And then they looked at task performance during the ring. Um, and it turns out, lo and behold, uh, attention, this is sounding smartphone, non-sounding smartphone, that was the control give it just sat there, non-sounding. Okay, This is uh, attention, this is memory, and you see memory and attention goes down when your smartphone's ringing. So this is almost 10 years ago. Now I'll show you a study that came out one year ago and it looked at what happens if your smartphone sits here and doesn't ring. <laughs> it just sits here. <laughs> this is the study and it's called brain drain. The mere presence of one's own smartphone reduces ab available cognitive capacity. So this is really important. So the control, well, if you, if you want to investigate what happens if it is here, what's the control? The control is it's in your bag down here or, it was a second control, it's in the other room. So now we look at, they, they either did a computerized, basically thought, you had to think about things and, and, and respond, and so it was a thinking test. And then they also did an IQ test, a very simple, culture-free IQ test for those of you in the know, it's Raven's Matrices, which is worldwide used as, a, as an intelligence test. Yeah, and you can com computerize it, okay? So here you have the results. This is working memory capacity, another way of saying thinking capacity, with a smartphone, with your smartphone in the other room, in your pocket, or on your desk. So your working memory capacity goes down by about 10%. This is fluid intelligence. So it goes down if you have your smartphone on your desk. And the difference here, it's again about 7-8%, which is the difference between, uh, in Germany, uh, Abitur and uh, middle school. So if you hired people with an with a, with a Abitur and you let them put their smartphone on their desk, you're working with people who have middle school. I mean, this is just your smartphone on your desk, reducing your IQ, measurably so. And the reason is very simple, because you, you are used to use this all the time. It draws your mental capability, because you, you, all the time now you must not look at this thing. But it kind of nags at you. Hey, come on, there may be some interesting mail, there may be interesting news. So just you suppressing your urge to look at it, draws measurable amounts of cognitive capacity from you and, and if you measure IQ or working memory capacity, you can see the effect. It's really amazing that they, that they could see a clear effect of just the smartphone kind of getting at you and you were resisting this thing, uh, so not, you're not, not getting at it. Okay. So this is just to argue this is a distraction. I mean, this is clearly showing that this is, even if it doesn't go on, just by being around, this is a distractor. Okay. I tell this people who say, well, we have to have more smartphone use in schools. German politicians responsible for education say this. We need more smartphones in schools. Well, then we will have less learning in schools, period. Uh, decreased learning, this is uh, next topic. If you have decreased attention, you have decreased learning. The relationship between cell phone use, academic performance, anxiety and satisfaction with life. This is a large scale study that came out already in 2014. These are the results. The more you use your smartphone, the less your academic achievement. These were 17 year olds, so this is end of, is this end of high school. Okay. 
the more you are anxious and both academic, less academic achievement and more anxiety give you less satisfaction with life. So this is your smartphone, what is do, what's it doing to you? This is a study that came out September 26 in 2018. So it's roughly a month old or two months old. So what they did here, to make a long story short, I've written this up for you, it's at 4,500 children, 8 to 11 years old, from 21 sites in the US. They were looked at September 16 to September 17. Under study were sleep, sports, and screen media use. And they found and they measured cognitive development of these 8 to 11 year olds. And they clearly found effects of all three of them. And the, there was an effect of sleep. The more they sleep, the better they, they, their cognitive development. The more they do sports, the better their cognitive de de development. The effect of sleep was about this big. The effect of sports was this big. And then there was an effect of screen media, and it was negative, and it was this big. So the screen media effect was the biggest effect they found, and it was the one negative effect they found. Okay? And they clearly say, well, we should take note. So in elementary school, screen media are really bad for cognitive development. This is what comes out of a large-scale study that just got published. This is old. This is 2012. Uh, cognitive effects on memory. And they basically, these were psychologists from Columbia and Harvard University. It got published in Science Magazine. So these are good people publishing in the high power science journal. And what did they do? They gave information via books, journals, or um, newspaper, or with Google. And a few days later, they looked at what, what was retained in memory. And they did this with five groups. And they found the same thing in all five groups. That is, Google, if you Google something, it's least likely to stick in your memory. So Google is the worst medium if you want to learn. Books are better, journals are better, newspapers are better than Google. The politicians in Germany say we must do more Googling in school. The answer is no, we don't. And then um, electronic textbooks. German politicians say, well, we haven't learned yet to figure out how to do things right because we have not really found that computers are good at school. We just have to do the digitization right. So if we have a textbook, we not just scan it in and put it on as a PDF on a, on a, on a, a tablet. No, we put in videos. So you click on them and it, on it goes. And we don't do references. Nobody looks them up in the library anyway. No, we put in hyperlinks. You click on them, you're right there. Isn't that great? So you can have enhanced e-books. They say, and again, this is Science Magazine 2012 already. They say, if you do that, really bump up the digital capabilities of your textbooks, the learning gets worse. And the reason is really simple. Reading is good for learning. Clicking is not. And if you spend an hour reading, you learn. If you spend an hour reading and clicking, you learn less. Because again, it's, destru it's destructive and, uh, and is a destruction to your learning process. The more happens here, the more you know, neurons transmit information between them, the more the synaptic connections between them change. And we call this change learning. So if you just click and don't think much, you learn less. I mean, it's, it has to be that way. Nicely, they found it exactly that way. Okay. In fact, computers take away information processing from our brains. That's why we use them as tools for brain work. But because of this fact, computers are no learning machines. They are learning prevention machines because everything that happens to happen here in order to change the brain, and we call this learning. Anything you outsource from here to here, well, it doesn't happen here, which is why you learn less, period. It's as simple as that. Um, Brains don't do downloads. This is what I just have said to you. Okay? <laughs> Brains are used, and then they change. And this is how learning works. And this is an important, this is a very important insight. I mean, think about the digital natives. We learn, oh, digital natives, they outsource a lot, which is why they can't do this and that. But because of this, uh, they can do other things because they have freed up space to do other things. You have heard this argument. I'm sure you have. This argument is complete nonsense. Let me tell you why. You know, this computer has a hard drive and it has a CPU. The CPU does the number crunching and the hard drive does the, 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 the memory. Okay. What's in here? Well, 100 billion neurons. 
and they do the number crunching. They process information by sending information back and forth between them, thereby changing their connections, which is the memory. So here we don't have the separation of, of the processing and the memory. No, the processing is the memory and the memory is the processing. What follows? Interesting things. When this hard drive is half full, it has half the capacity left. If the hard drive is 95% full, it has 95, it has 5% capacity left. How about this? Well, let me ask you. Here are two Germans, or Danish for that matter. He knows Danish, and he knows Danish and four more languages. Now both learn a new language. Who's better at that? This guy? Hands up. This guy? Sure. M musical instruments, same thing, okay? He knows, knows nothing, he knows four. They, this guy le learns the next one easier than this guy, okay? And this is the case with anything. Or have you ever met somebody saying, well, you know, I know five languages, by now my language centers are full? <laughs> Thanks for laughing, because that's exactly my point. Your brain, and you probably have never realized that, has a very interesting feature. The more is in there, the more still fits in there. It doesn't get full. No, it's just the opposite. The more languages you know, the easier it is to learn another one. In fact, there are people who know 50 languages, they learn the 50 first within about six weeks. And you can't, I mean, if, if it took you six years like your mother tongue for every one of the 50 languages, you had to be 300 to get it at 50 and there's no way to be that old. So, but there are people who know 50 languages. So it, it gets you there ever faster. Because again, the CPU is the hard drive and the hard drive is the CPU. What follows? The more you have learned as a young person, the, it, the, the easier it is to continue learning. Lifelong learning, you have solved that uh, when you learned until 20 or 25 in the gymnasium and you went to the university, then you can be a lifelong learner because a lot is in there and the more is in there, the better it works and the better you can use it for picking up other stuff. It follows, another thing follows. If you're 20 or 25, and there's little in there, hardly anything more fits in there. And that's the problem. Which is why we really have to take care of a good education at young age. You can't redo this later. That's a very important insight. And the more you outsource as a young person, the harder it is to learn more when you are older. Okay, not learning English in school doesn't make you a better learner of Chinese when you're 20 because you have saved space. Do you get that point? It's a really important point. So when people say, oh, the digital natives, they do outsourcing and therefore they can do some things better because they have freed up space. It's, an, it's a complete nonsense. It's a complete nonsense. The same nonsense. Oh, they don't need to know anything. They can Google everything. That's another nonsense. Um, let me make this clear. Did you, do you know Morbus Google? It's not, it's not uh, my word. It, uh, this is a publication, came out in 2009, was done by engineers from Microsoft. They looked at a couple of thousand Google researches within the domain of medicine by lay people. And they looked, what happens if a lay person Googles headache or muscle twitches or chest pain? And the answer is within one, 0 0.1 milliseconds you end up at brain tumor, ALS, and a heart attack. And the search continues for about 90 minutes and then breaks and, do and doesn't get to an answer or any, uh, any insight. But it just leads to ever more knowledge on brain, uh, well, site visits on brain tumors and, and all the hell that breaks loose when you, when you go into Google and Google headache. Okay, same thing with, uh, with uh, twitches, you end up with ALS and you learn that you have a a very bad way of dying and all that. And, uh, and next day they will continue searching, but they won't find anything that solves their problem. They will go to another doctor, they will, they will have sleeping pills and, and some, 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 some talks with a therapist uh, to make their condition better. And, um, and in Germany there are now half a dozen papers out showing that this costs the German system one to two percent of healthcare. 
given that we pay 1 billion euros a day for German healthcare. The healthcare system spends a billion a day on healthcare in Germany. Okay. One to two percent of this is, is seven, seven billion roughly a day, well, per year, if you add this up. Okay. So it's a, it's a substantial cost on the German economy in a, in, in a way. What, how, how can you prevent Morbus Google? It's actually very simple. If you use Google for, me, for a medical search, it really does help to have studied medicine before. If you're a doctor, well, you know things and you can easily see, say, this is complete nonsense, I, this is important and this, so, so you find your way and you find, I'm a psychiatrist, I find the tiny bit of evidence on something in psychiatry within seconds because I, I, I know my way around, okay? My point is, you have to have pre-existing knowledge to use Google. If you don't know anything in a particular domain and start using Google within that domain, it's completely hopeless. This is what this case shows so nicely. Okay. So it, what's, what, what doesn't exist is some general capability of sorting out the truth from falsehood. Such a capability sometimes called media knowledge, media competency, internet, driver, internet driver's license, or they have different names for that, does not exist and cannot exist. Because sorting out truth from falsehood basically presupposes knowing the field that you want to sort out facts within. Okay? There is no general internet capability and once you have it you can google anything and find out everything and sort out easily the wheat from the chaff no there isn't so now the conclusion is if google is not the way for knowledge to get in here because as i've shown in science magazine by a psychologist from harvard uh, google is the least best way to acquire knowledge knowledge is the requisite the prerequisite of using google so if we really take it serious that we want to educate our kids such that they can even use Google once they're through the educational system, there's one thing we must not do within the educational system, that is using Google. You probably have never heard that. They always say, well, we have to use Google in order to learn how to use Google. That's nonsense. You have to have knowledge, and Google is not the way you get at that. And once you have knowledge, you can use Google. That's, a, that's an important point uh, when it comes to, well, we have to have media education as early as possible. No, because it hampers and hinders learning. Uh, this is a, a nice illustration, Science Magazine 2017. This is data from 1.8 million um, MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. And they grouped the data such that each point is a state, a country on the globe. The, the size of the point is the number of MOOC users in that country that went into this investigation. And then this is the completion rate. By the way, it's abysmal. So massive open online courses, that is e-learning, e has a success rate between 2 and 8%. So it's a failure rate between 92 and 98%. I mean, if I create a new operational procedure in surgery and the death rate is 98%. I'm not getting famous with this. Okay. And if I advertise this, we have a breakthrough in, uh, in surgery with 89% failure rate. I'm not, I, I wouldn't be taken serious. But look at the e-learning community. What, look at all the hype. E-learning is great. E-learning is the future. E-learning is wonderful. Well, this is how, how good it works. And on top of this, these are this is Human Development Index. These are basically, it's a grouping of the state, how developed they are. So this is Burkina Faso, and this is maybe Denmark or Germany or US or whatever. What you can see is the learning is better the more you already have been educated in your system. So this is uh, just one data set of 1.8 million people clearly demonstrate the more is in there, the more will still fit in. Okay, and the more is in there, the easier learning is. So you have to make sure a lot of gets in there during education, that is, in the first two decades of life. There's another reason for this. This is Jim Hackman published in, 12 years ago this graph in a, um, 
in a paper that was about the um, uh, return of investment in education depending upon the age of the, the learner. And the, the three-page paper is nicely summarized in this only figure that was in the paper. So if you want to spend a euro on education and you want to, to get the most education out of that euro, at what time of the to be educated do you invest that euro? During kindergarten. Whoops, sorry. During kindergarten. School, it's okay. And well, it's not so okay here. Okay. But just to remind you, this is one side of the coin. This is basically how fast synapses change. And a child will pick up a new word in one instant and use it five weeks later. And parents are, oh, he heard that, you know, five weeks ago. And now he uses it. This is wonderful. He is a fast learner. Now every, every kid is, is such a fast learner. And we take, well, here it takes 10 presentations. Here it takes a few more. And so we, we are getting slower and slower when we pick up new information. But the, the, uh, the flip side of this is what I've just told you, that the more you already know, the easier it is to figure out other things. So we all compensate for the slowing of our synaptic changes by already knowing a lot, which is why we can still continue learning. Not that fast, but we can still learn for our entire life. This is what follows. We start as babies to learn really quickly, and the, I mean, this is, sorry, this is a German, but um, this is basically brain building. You could also say brain education. You may just as well say education. My point is, there's really matter changes. I mean, synapses are built millions by the second in babies. We know this, because the number of synapses in your brain is one million billion. That's a one with 15 zeros behind. That's the number of synapses in your brain. And they come about by using your brain. If you're not using it, they don't come about, period. In fact, they're even removed. And there are critical periods. So this has to be, this has, this has to happen here. If it doesn't happen here, here it won't happen. Okay. And just to make a little point, my book is it's called Digital Dementia, and I have been ridiculed. Hey, well, how, can you, how can you say this? And how can, this, you don't have any study showing a thousand babies with digital information technology and a thousand babies without, and then you wait until they're 80, and then you measure how many demented babies or well, grown-ups you have in each group. And, once you have, and as you don't have such a study, because there cannot be such a study, what, what, what the heck are you saying with digital dementia? Well, my point is really simple. If digital media interfere with education, and I will show you data on this, I will still show you data on this, so you will, won't get here. You will probably get here with your, with your life uh, brain development. Okay. And as you all know, eventually there is mental decline. This is what this curve is supposed to symbolize. Okay. But for every descent, decline, there's a very simple truism. The higher you start, the longer it takes you to get down. So if your brain development ended, had you ended end here, and you, you, have, you get some brain disorder that causes mental decline. And there are Morbus Alzheimer or multi-infarct dementia. There are actually dozens of brain disorder that cause neuronal death and mental decline. But if you are up here and you start to decline mentally, you get your dementia by about 150. So you happen to be dead before that. So you don't get your dementia. We do know this. There's actually, you know, I'm asked every day as a psychiatrist, um, what, what shall I do? I notice some decline in my mental capabilities. What, what do you recommend? Crossword, puzzle, Sudoku, computer training, should I eat broccoli uh, or, or exercise? So here's, here, here's my answer. Yeah, broccoli and blueberries, they help a bit. Exercise helps a bit. But there's one big thing that you have to do is uh, get a grandchild. Because the grandchild is constantly nagging at you, okay, and asks difficult questions. And that's his or her's job because that keeps your brain happy and healthy. You have to use it a lot. And crossword puzzles are no help because you just call up what you already know. So it's of no use for brain training. It's just like other things that, you know, screens, etc. There's no evidence that this helps. 
But um, being with other people, actively participating, helping others, that's the big thing. Grandchildren, uh, doing voluntary work, dancing, singing, laughing. This is really what gets you off this path and more to, onto this path. But the big things are here. If you know two languages and if you get demented, you get your dementia five years later. When I published this, there were three studies showing this. Now there are six showing this. Handiwork, music, sports, theater. These are the important school subjects because they give you a few more lives at the end of your life. What you do in school is basically dementia prevention. And it gives you a lot of more years. Okay? You probably didn't know this, but that's the, that's the case. And if you impair education, you'll be at risk for early dementia. By the way, these disorders, let's take Alzheimer's disease. Maybe many people think Alzheimer's, that's a disease of old age. Wrong. When there were the, the world wars, world wars were really a bond for brain research because you had a lot, a lot of dead brains that you could examine. And in both wars, they used brains of soldiers and studied them, and they found morbid Alzheimer's in 18-year-olds already present. And there are people who have a brain full of Alzheimer's, got tested for dementia and didn't have any dementia. Then they died, their brain was looked at and it was full of Alzheimer's. But these were people who were really bright. And then there are professors who die of dementia. How can this be? Did you know that the youngest patient after whose death dementia was found, Alzheimer's I must say, was found in the brain was six. Yes, you can be six and already have Alzheimer's pathology in your brain. It won't probably hurt because it may be slow, slow developing and then, you, and then you may be highly educated and you may still get your dementia at 150, that is you die earlier. And then there are, there are disorders that get you really fast, neuronal death, and then you may even come up from here and you go down, down like this and then you may be the professor who, di who dies of dementia with 80. But by and large, the more educated they are, you are, the, the, the longer it takes for you to develop dementia. And then there are a lot of disorders and their speed is very different. So it depends upon, well, the disorder you have and its severity and its growth rate when you will, you as an individual, get your dementia. But again, the biggest preventive factor is your education at young age that will, pre that will prevent you getting demented at old age which is why digital dementia makes a lot of sense. It's not a specific disorder. It's the way to speed it up, okay? Not getting as high and then going down from here and you're right there. This is more dementia, I dealt with this. So, um, a few more data that's, you know, this is not me saying it. This, this is a, a paper in Scientific American. Students are better off without a laptop in the classroom. Uh, some data, uh, fall 2017, they had, a, they had a class um, with uh, two hours per week. And then they had about 100 people in that class, it was 60, 17 year olds. And they had a, a test at the end of the class. And the class taught some new subject. And every uh, kid had a computer. And the computer was hooked to a server so they could do class work with the computer. They could also go to the internet and do other things because there was that it was implied that they could do searches, etc. So they could use their computer for many things and uh, in that class. The server monitored all the activity, so the server also knew what every kid did when. This came out. In 35% of course time, they did non-academic things. What? They, we were in Facebook, they were shopping, they were reading email, chatting, reading sports news, watched videos and played games. Every single one of these seven activities was negatively correlated with the exam score, which is trivial. If you spend your time on other things, you learn less, period. But there was another finding. They also monitored the time people spent in front of their computers doing some, some things for the academic work that they were to do in this course. It turns out there was no correlation between academic use of computers and the exam score. This is really weird. I mean, the more they used the computer, they didn't get better at what they learned. So if computers, let's say, were like a pill against stupidity in young age, Okay, and you took studies 
this one and the few one I'm showing you now, okay? And you would send this in and say, I want approval for this pill. Any medical regulatory uh, institution, the FDA, the German Bundesgesundheitsamt, they would send back, no way you get this pill approved because it doesn't have any effect and it has a lot of side effects. And we don't approve pills with no effect and side effects. Okay. So let me show you more studies. This is, this is one of, probably the best study on computers and education. It was published by people of the Military Academy in West Point, USA. And they say, hey, we have highly motivated students. We have the best from the country. They want to make a career in the military and they really are highly motivated. They want to learn, etc., etc. So what did they do? They had 50 classrooms with 727 students. So they had small classrooms and they had professors going in and out of the classroom. They had a whole semester and then they had a lot of exams after the semester. And so they, and they did this. At the same time, they randomized the 50 classrooms into three groups. One group got a laptop and a tablet, one got just a tablet, and one got nothing. And then they looked at the grades at the end of the, of the semester, okay? It turns out those were 20% better than these two. So these do, were doing best. And the authors say, well, we got a huge effect. And the effect is going to be bigger in any other uh, educational environment because here we have highly motivated people they don't gonna go off and uh, well go to Facebook and shopping etc they want to make a career and even though they are highly motivated computers have a clearly demonstrable debilitating effect on learning okay and since this was randomized controlled there's hardly anything you can say against this study and it had a clear-cut effect computers are not good for education these are data from the PISA. You know the PISA studies that they have been done for almost 20 years. They are looking at 15-year-olds. In Germany, it's always 30 to 40,000 per, well, every three years they do this. And so you get an idea, uh, and, and this is done in the OECD, that's 32 countries, and many other countries have kind of joined in. So these are data from more than 50 countries. And what the head of the PISA studies, Andreas Schleicher, did, he looked at 10 years of PISA development in different countries. That is, he looked from 2003 till 2012. What happened to the average grade in this particular country? Did it go up or down? And his independent variable, so he had also another variable, and that is how much did the country invest in computers and education per capita? So some countries invest a lot in computers per school kid and other countries invested not so much in computers per school kid. Now think about it, if we now plot here the amount of money that was spent on computers and we plot here how the PISA scores did, okay, we would expect a graph like this. The more investment in computers, the more the, the better the PISA score went, okay? Well this is the actual graph. This clearly shows you, and this is a data from hundreds of thousands of kids on billions of money. I mean, this is Australia. They spent in 2008 2.4 billion Australian dollars in digitization of schools. And they really got much worse, like New Zealand. Finland got really bad, okay. Sweden, not so good. Denmark, not so good. And I, you know, in Germany, we are about to spend 5 billion for digitization of schools. And we have article after article in the last year, oh, we are way behind, we have to get going, we must digitize schools. Well, you look at this graph, I'm happy with Germany. We are actually getting, have gotten a bit better and we are not so much, in, haven't, we haven't in this period, not so much invested in digitization. Okay. And this correlation, the correlation is 0.5. This is the square of the correlations or the explained variance. 0.5 is a serious correlation. And this is 50 countries and hundreds of thousands of kids. So you can't dismiss these data and say we are not now investing in computers. This is what my country does and we are actually changing our constitution to, 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 to be able to do so. It's, it's insane and it's actually a scandal. Do the media talk about it? No. No word. It's, just, it's even scary. Big study, just to, just to finish this, uh, in May 2050, economists from, uh, from England, 
they looked at uh, mobile phone policies, and this is mobile bans from 2002 to 2012. Um, there were mobile phone bans introduced in schools. It, they started with three schools and it ended with 90 schools. Then they got the, 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 the yearly um, grades from all the students in all the schools five years before the ban and five years behind the ban, after the ban. Okay? So they, they, could, they could juggle these, these different schools and put them such that at point zero, everybody started with a ban, no matter when it was. And then they could do means of the school grades. And this is how the means changed. Before the school ban, it, juggled, it, it bounced around zero, not statistically significantly so. So this is all not significant, this is zero. And a year after the ban, it was already statistically significant above. So they got better. And they are getting better and better and better the longer the smartphone ban is implemented in the school. So should we give out smartphones or should we ban them in schools? The answer is really clear. We should ban them in schools. Okay. Macron obviously read this study of the French president. He has banned smartphones for that reason, not for the blinding reason as Xi Jinping in, Germany, uh, in, 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 in China. Okay. But here we have a detrimental effect on education of smartphones. And this is 130,000, so you can hardly dismiss this as a, as a methods artifact or something. Okay? It, it's a clear-cut effect. And one more thing, if you have so much data, you can do subgroup analysis, which is what they did. So they looked at the 20% lowest grade kids, the next 20%, the middle 20%, the good and the very good 20%. And they measured how did they do after the ban, and this is what came out. These are the lowest grade children, and they benefit most from the ban. The good kids don't change. And this is important because that fits very well with about a half a dozen other studies, all showing that the so-called digital divide or social divide, that is, you have academic kids and they are better in education, they do better than, people from, than kids from workers. And there is a lot of debate in Germany. We should close that achievement gap that is dependent upon uh, your social economic background. Okay. By the way, the difference between a six-year-old from the lower class and from the higher class, that is six-year-old just entering school, is 30 million words that the six-year-old from the higher class has heard more than the six-year-old six from the lower class. The lower class kid has heard about eight million words of his life, in his lifetime in, at six and the upper class get almost 40, 000, 40 million words. So when you start schooling, which is language-based learning, with a disadvantage of 30 million words, that is one-fourth one of the training of the, of the good people, there's no way you can compensate for that. What I'm saying is the dependency on socioeconomic status of your ed education outcome is already there when you start school. And there's very little a school can do. What you could do is get children into daycare, particularly lower class kids, so that they are talk, that people talk to, to the kids, which is highly important. And lower class mothers don't talk as much, partly because they aren't there, they have to work, partly because they are not so language oriented people or whatever. In the southeastern German state of Bavaria, lower class mothers are paid for not getting their kids into kindergarten, which is a terrible idea. <laughs> They should be paid for getting their kids in kindergarten. But it's just the law is just the opposite. So school politics are sometimes really post-fact politics. So what you can see here is that what many politicians say and what the digital lobby says, that just give lower class kids uh, for free an internet device and free internet uh, access, you'll fix their problem in education. This is ideologically motivated wishful thinking. What is fact is, if you digitize schools, you hurt the lower class kids the most. That's just the opposite as politicians claim. Well, here is more German studies. Um, they all show there's no effect. Um, uh, another German study, no effect. Um, so, no significant differences in competency. In the net book, that is, uh, internet capability notebook, okay? And um, 
There was not, both studies, and were large scale studies, even found no effect of using a computer and the internet at school on the capabilities of the children using the internet and computers. So the last resort argument of the pro people is always, well, you know, Dr. Spitzer, okay, they don't learn math, biology, and, and spelling, so, but we have to bring in computers in schools because we have to teach them how to use computers. And then I say, well, it has been shown in several studies that bringing computers and internet to schools doesn't increase the capability of kids with computers and internet. This is the outcome of large-scale German studies. It's not me saying this. It's, it's actually quite embarrassing, okay? They have no effect, not even on computer skills, the computers in schools. Well, here's a Silicon Valley school that doesn't compute, uh, so they advertise we have no computers in our schools, and who sends the kids there? The employees of Google, Apple, Yahoo, and Hewlett Packard, okay? So they know what's good for the kids. <laughs> Stephen Jobs said, iPads are not good for kids. And the now chairman of Apple, Tim Cook, said, my nephew, iPad school. No, definitely not. It's not good. Um, well, and we do five. We spent five. That was in the news a couple of days ago in Germany. We spent five billion to digitize schools. And, uh, and gaming makes you bright. We have, well, we have the media brainwashing the population, saying it's all is good and well, and it's wonderful to do all this. OK. Um, just a study that came out recently, parents and smartphones. They did, an, they did a study where they invited 225 mothers and children in the psych lab and said, we do the lunch test. You just have lunch, the two of you. You get bowls with something to eat four times, different things. And we film you. That's that. It turns out that almost 25% of the mothers spontaneously used their mobile phone during eating. And then they could look at the effects of using the mobile phone while mother and child are eating. That's what the, that's what the point of the study. Okay. So what happens when the mother uses the smartphone and they both are eating? You have 20% less verbal communication, 40% less nonverbal communication, and you have about 30% less encouragement. Now come on, eat a little bit, okay, by the mother. Now they looked at, they had four different kinds of food, and they, the, they manipulated the, um, uh, the um, um, uh, familiarity of the food. So here is halva. I didn't know what that is. It is a very sweet uh, Arabic uh, dessert. And uh, so in case you didn't know, I didn't know either. So this was not known by most of the mothers and most of the kids. Now they looked specifically what happens if they don't know what they are going to eat to the communication and the encouragement. Well, it went down almost twice as much compared to in the case where they know. And the authors say, hey, it's not just bad, it's worse than you think. Because the smartphone is really detrimental when, when, it, when, it, when a situation comes up when there would be something to learn. Then interaction between mother and child really goes down. So not, a, not only does the smartphone affect interaction between mother and child, it affects interaction between mother and child at the very occasions most when there would have been something to learn. So it's, it's worse than you think when it comes to smartphones effect on learning in mother-child interaction. Nonetheless, you know what? I'm optimistic. <laughs> I mean, notwithstanding all I said, I'm more optimistic. Okay? Well, let me finish with optimistic notes and then I uh, uh, wrap up. I'm optimistic simply because when this suicidal thing in America came up, you know, with Professor Gene Twenger, Apple investors wrote a letter to Apple. It was 6th of January um, 2018. And they wrote, it was actually published in the Wall Street Journal. So Apple investors wrote, hey, uh, you know, the smartphone is not good for, uh, for some health aspects. Did you know that? And if five billion people is going to sue you, Apple, brackets, the richest company on earth, brackets, no matter, you're going to be broke, and it's our money. So do something. That's, that's remarkable, okay? It's not me saying this, it's Apple investors saying this. And do you know what? Apple has responded. 
at the uh, last developer conference where they present normally new iPhones and new stuff. It was 5th, 5th of June 2018. Apple basically presented new software. It was an extension of the operating system such that you can control your own iPhone use in a better way. The iPhone tells you, you did so, went so, so many minutes into Facebook, you did this and this and this and this and overall use was this. And even the Apple chairman Tim Cook said, I was amazed that I used my smartphone about twice as much as I thought I would. So it can help you control your own and actually it can also help you control the smartphone use of your kids because there are features that you can control whatever they do with their smartphone and you can look at that. So this is an interesting thing that happened, okay? And another thing happened. This was beginning of September in Germany and this was in the news. It was also in the daily evening TV news that every German watches the Tagesschau. And so here you have it. A seven-year-old -year boy organizes a public demonstration and the demo was about, hey parents, watch more us compared to your smartphone. Don't look at your smartphone, watch us. So this was the demonstration that they organized. They had a couple of hundred people c coming out and protesting for more children watching and less smartphone watching. This came after a summer when several German kids drowned because their parents were looking at their smartphones, not at their kids, and the kids died for that reason. So he had a background that was quite terrible for doing this. Okay? So this really, I, I think, there are quite a few things going on including this meeting, by the way, that are really positive. And uh, let me, if, if, if I may, have five more minutes. I'm, I'm due to one twenty, and I had one thirty, so maybe five more minutes. Then we will we'll discuss, okay? But, but I haven't talked about risks and side effects for society. And I will do this just by two or three examples to show you this is maybe even the worst aspect than, than compared to every aspect I saw. It's maybe it's worse than health and worse than education. And let me just briefly run you through uh, the four examples that I have done. So this came out in Science Magazine in March 2018. They found analyzing 126,000 Twitter stories and looked at the 4.5 million times that they got retweeted by about four, uh, 3 million people. And they found, in, in a nutshell, that one commentator said this, the truth is already is, is still um, doing the shoelaces when falsity is half around the globe already. So falsity spreads about 10 times faster and further out than truth. And they found it, this is not depending upon Twitter bots and all the machinery of Twitter. No, this is because of a bad interaction between Twitter and the human brain. Because human brains don't care for anything just like anything else. They care for information that has a higher, or for news that have a higher informational content. And it just so happens that false news have more informational content than most of the true news. If I tell you 2 plus 2 is 4, well, you probably don't retweet it because you know this and it's not very interesting. If I tell you the Pope's pregnant, hey, this is... <laughs> at least wrong on two counts, okay, and, um, and so you will retweet that. It seems to be a much more interesting news. Well, it happens to be false, okay. So false news, by its very nature of being against what you already know and what is likely, okay, have a higher information content, which is why they get retweeted. So it's basically, this is why rumors spread so fast. But Twitter is basically a turbocharged rumor engine which is why we have so much fake news. It's basically because we are so curious about unlikely things. So it's not just Twitter to blame, it's us to blame as well. This is also amazing. This, case, this was a New York Times story, front page story on March 10th, 2018. YouTube the Great Radicalizer. The story is this. They did investigations and found that YouTube um, well, it's, it's the leading media for moving pictures. No longer TV, it's YouTube. The world watches a billion hours of YouTube videos per day. One billion hours. But con in contrast to TV, most of what is looked at in YouTube is recommended by the YouTube recommendation algorithm because you look at the video and then it suggests the next one. 
And this is how Google makes money because Google re records how long you spend in YouTube and every minute counts because you, you can get uh, advertisements and this is the, the income of Google. So they want to glue you to the screen for the longest possible time. The way to do this they found out several times and always the same thing they first thought about it, did algorithms, then they did machine learning and the machine learning found the same thing. What you do in order to glue people to the YouTube screen is the next video you show is a, a little bit more radical than the one than the previous one. And the next one is still a little more radical. So you go, oh, 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 and, and this sticks you. Uh, so to give an example, you start with the uh, veg uh, vegetarian uh, food and five videos later you end up with vegan food. You start out with jogging and five videos later you are at the ultra marathon. You start out with Bill Clinton and a few, you are at Marx. You start out with W. Bush and you are at the Ku Klux Klan or so. I, it, politically it works really well, but it works in any respect that you get ever more radical videos. And this, is, this is the business model of YouTube and Google, its owner. Okay. But so it follows that 800 million hours of YouTube videos is watched by mankind per day that are more radical than the watcher. And this cannot have one consequence, no consequence. Because whatever runs across our brains, we have understood this really well changes it. So if 800 million hours more radical video are watched by humankind, this cannot not radicalize humankind. There's no way, which is amazing. And again, it's the business model. We could change that when we made the internet no longer free. It's not, it's not to blame YouTube, it's the business model behind Google and YouTube. If the internet was not for free, if we wouldn't, then we wouldn't pay with our attention, then all this advertisement business would be lost. We had to pay, but it would be much cheaper when you, when you Google, look at the, that the outcomes. Did you know that there was a, a nature paper in 2012 on a one, 61 million person experiment on social influence and political mobilization using Facebook. And they say, yes, we can manipulate elections. It was the Congress election, not the presidential elections. But this was, it was published in, the, in a high power science journal. Yes, we can manipulate uh, elections. Uh, 2014, an experiment on only 700,000 people. We can manipulate the emotions of the, the Facebook user by sending them emotionally sadder or more happier news feeds. And they succeeded in doing so. Published this in PNAS. Um, we can do personality judgments from Facebook likes. So this is with nine Facebook likes, you can predict the personality as good as a work colleague. Uh, with with uh, 65, you're just as good as a friend. Um, with uh, 100 or with uh, 125, you're just good as a family, okay? And with 500, you're better than the person himself or herself by uh, predicting the personality. So this is 2015. You, with Facebook likes, you can do personality prediction. This is 2017. Using the Facebook likes and the personality profile, you can send uh, advertisements to extroverts or introverts and open or less open people. I mean, from, as you know from Facebook. And this works 50% better in, for more purchases. 40% more clicks and 50% more purchases. This is huge effect. So we know, yes, you can manipulate elections. Yes, you can influence people. Yes, they spend 50% more money. So it works and you can make a lot of money with this, which is why we, have, we had Trump, the Brexit, and 200 more manipulated elections on the globe before this scandal came up and the company was closed. I am saying that without a smartphone and Facebook on it, etc., we wouldn't have Trump now and we wouldn't have the Brexit now. And that's published. I mean, you can look at the literature, the Mueller investigation. It, I mean, it's, yes, it's published. Okay. So to conclude, this is body side effects, mind side effects, education side effects, society side effects. So it comes with serious risks and side effects. And it has not been assessed. That's the big problem. And we are constantly brainwashed by the most powerful lobby on earth with hype and fake news. 
and the damage is most serious during brain development. You are basically off the hook, but under 25 you aren't. Therefore, we must not sacrifice the health and the education of our children, our most precious resource, that is our future, to the profit interest of the richest companies on earth. This would be irresponsible. It's a great tool, um, but digital IT should serve us all, not just a handful of billionaires. Take note. Spread the word. Thanks.